I don't know why, but whenever I go live, I get the Bruce Springsteen song going down stuck in my head. I don't know why. I just don't know. All right, so I'm going to do a little bit of editor's desking. Uh, editor's desk, if you don't already know, maybe you even already get it, is a little feature that I do for the patrons every week uh, where I answer questions. Maga, Raymond, good to see you. Um, mahalo or mahalo. That's a Hawaiian. <laughs> Salamat for joining us. Uh, and anyway, editor's desk is um, um, is is me answering questions or talking about updating on on the the behind the scenes of the show, why we do things the way we do, and all that sort of thing. We got some juicy questions today. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna blaze through a bunch of these. So. All right, um, here we go. So many great questions. Thank you, everyone, uh, for sending your amazing questions. We got really good stuff. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. I'm going to get through a bunch of them this time. I don't know if I'll get through all of them. Uh, so if you don't hear yours answered, uh, hang in there. Uh, but Reagan says... This is a thing I've been thinking about for a while, but wasn't really sure the best way to ask it. So here we go. How much do the Patreon quarterly rewards cost you as a creator? I've opted into receiving them because I like the stickers and postcards. But when I, whenever I get a bigger item, like a t-shirt, I've often wished that whatever that cost would go to you as a creator instead of the merch that I don't really need. Um, yes, the, the theory with the merch is that the cost of it is worth it because the effect of sending it keeps enough people in general. So not not don't think of yourself specifically or and what you would do, but in general, enough people say, well, I don't want to cancel because I like getting the fun postcards and stickers and stuff like that. Uh, so that uh, the, the, that's supposed to work out. Uh, I overdid it this year and I gave, uh, I, I assigned merch too low for the cost. Uh, and it really, it really, it really hurt. <laughs> uh, it had an impact. The idea would have been that like, well, if I, to correct my mistake, we had the ad revenue to rely on, but the ad revenue drived up this year too. So, uh, so yeah, I wish there was a way for you to have a little more control over what stuff you get. I just have to assign it and that's the way it goes. And I don't like to give four stickers in a year because a lot of people get tired of stickers. So I want to vary it. I also like to say, to think like, hey, if you've stayed a patron for nine months, you deserve a t-shirt versus just a sticker. Uh, so that's kind of the theory on that. Um, but this is good. This is good feedback and, and it'll, it'll definitely shape how I set up the merch to run uh next year because it you, you have to change it every year uh thank you for that question kyle said i've noticed that you are asking for certain types of positive only feedback from listeners to be read on the main dtns show for example thirty five hundred dollar sneaker shaped pc foldable laptops etc why are you doing this while I understand that neutral or passive aggressive comments don't make for entertaining content, your request sounds like a sports casker asking fans to run naked across the sports ball field. It's coming across a little over the top. Kyle, I was with you until the sports caster analogy. Uh, I, I don't see saying, tell me why you would use a foldable laptop to be equivalent to asking someone to run naked across a football field. Um, you lost me there, Kyle. I'm, I'm just gonna gonna say, uh, but I do understand the the, the question. Um, it's not that I want positive only feedback. You described it as positive only feedback, and it's it's not that. Uh, I don't want people to send me uh, I like this emails. What I've noticed over the years in chat, in email, in all manners of feedback. If there's something new like foldables uh, or the sneaker shape PC, the knee jerk response of the majority of people is going to be, I hate that. It's dumb. I don't like it. I don't want it. 
So what I'm saying, uh, and, and I'll try to refine what I say so that it doesn't hit you the way it's been hitting you, Kyle, but what I'm trying to say is, uh, please send me whatever feedback you want. I'm not telling you what to send. If you send me the feedback that I'm expecting, I hate it. I don't want it. It's not fun. I don't like it. Um, I will read it. I will acknowledge it. I might even write you back, but I'm not going to read it on the show because that's obvious. That's the obvious feedback. That's, that's feedback that if I read it on the show, everyone would be like, well, yeah, uh, it's, it's what everyone expects. So I want the unexpected feedback. Uh, and maybe that's a better way to say it, which is, you know, I expect everyone to say they don't like it. But if you have another response, you're more likely to get read on the show. So I'm not soliciting positive only feedback. I want unusual feedback. I don't want the same old, same old that I'm like, when I get the email, I'm like, well, yeah, that's, that's what I expected. That, that, that's what everyone said. And so, um, I, 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 I will try to, to rephrase that Kyle. So it doesn't sound, certainly. So it doesn't sound like I'm asking people to run naked across the sports ball field, but, uh, but so it doesn't sound like I'm saying, I don't want your, uh, I only want you to say positive things. Um, cause it's not exactly that. It's just, I know everyone's knee jerk response is generally, I don't like things. Uh, so I'm, I'm not going to be, I'm not learning anything from that. I, I guess is what I'm saying. I want responses where we can all go, Ooh, that's interesting. I wouldn't have thought of that. Uh, so I'll, I'll try to put it that way. Thank you for that response. Josh says, hi, Tom. I wanted to ask how tech sites find folks who blend well together. For example, Molly Wood and you were such a fantastic pairing that I'm sure wasn't planned or any of the other journalists or reporters who work well together. Case in point, The Verge has a set of excellent reporters and somehow all of them have that exact amount of snark and editorialization that gives them unique brand. Is this a conscious effort or does it happen organically? Uh, the reason I ask is it matters more in the reporting space than other industries, given each site or newspaper has its own flavor slash theme. What an interesting question, Josh. Speaking of unexpected and interesting questions that uh, allow us to learn more from, uh, and a great one. Molly and I were such a fantastic pairing. I would argue, Josh, we are a fantastic pairing because you can still listen to us together on It's a Thing. Uh, and in fact, last week, we added a little segment to It's a Thing called Buzz Out Loud, where we just talked about something buzzy. In that case, it was net neutrality. Um, but yeah, uh, so the pairing with Molly and I specifically, uh, this doesn't answer your broader question, that was discovered and planned. Our producer, Mark Larkin, noticed that we, in meetings, uh, we just riff on each other, you know, and we had a good sense of humor and a good chemistry. And so he said, uh, hey, what if, you know, we've been talking about making a podcast at CNET. What if the podcast is you two doing this? We were, we were, I think if I remember right in the meeting, we were riffing off each other on something. He's like, let's do that on the show. So in, in that sense, it was organic in the sense that uh, we weren't planning to do a podcast together when we were riffing. We were just having fun, but it was planned in the sense that Mark recognized that and said, Hey, let's use that and make a show out of it. Um, I imagine it's probably a combination of both all the time. Uh, at the verge, I can't specifically comment on their culture because I don't work there, but my guess is there is a certain type of person attracted to working at The Verge. You read The Verge's articles, you like their style, you like the way they report, and you are likely to be like, gosh, I'd love to work at The Verge. Uh, vice versa, there is the idea that The Verge is more likely to hire people that fit their style. Uh, if, if you interview and you're like, by gosh, that's that's the kind of quirky uh, perspective that we love here at The Verge. You're more likely to get hired. So, so there's a filter that kind of is not planned, but sort of happens on its own. Uh, and then internally, when you're making a show, I think a lot of things that are similar to what happened with me and Molly happen of like, hey, you guys really seem to have a good rapport. Uh, or you try somebody on a show and you're like, nah, that didn't work out. Let's try somebody else until you get that good rapport. Um, I can't, again, I can't speak specifically to what actually happens there, but that, that's the kind of thing in my experience that can happen. So Josh, I hope that answers your question. Now on a previous episode of editor's desk, uh, somebody asked me about why I, uh, use Pat often as a, a generic person in examples. Um, 
And Marcus was among many people, and uh, too many people for me to remember and name right now, who originally thought when I said Pat, I was alluding to the Saturday Night Live character played by Julia Sweeney in the early 90s. Um, they were more making fun and awkwardly, although intentionally awkwardly, at the same reasoning. Um, and certainly, I'm aware of that character. And when I was trying to think of of names that apply, uh, that was an inspiration for that. Um, so you're not you're not entirely wrong. I'm not thinking of that Pat from Saturday Night Live when I imagined my Pat, but uh, but yeah, that that played a part in it. All right. Now, I might have to say, save that one for next week. Let me do this one uh, real quick. Corey asks, greetings, DTNS crew. Something that popped into my mind a few weeks back. How do you, Sarah, and Roger survive? Is DTNS a part-time thing and you have nighttime jobs to make end meets? Would you like fries with that? Uh, I can understand you and Roger because you are married and have shared income, but isn't Sarah single? Just something I've wondered about. I understand if this is a personal thing, but I bet I'm not the only person who's curious. Thanks for all you do. Hope you're not going hungry. Uh, Corey, uh, thank you for, for this. Um, yeah, I don't want to speak too much about what other people on the team are doing because that's their story to tell. Um, but uh, for the most part, Sarah, I, I, I will say the things that I know they have said publicly, which is Sarah has other gigs. Uh, she has another podcast she does with Heather Frank uh, called Have Such a Good Day. If you haven't checked it out, I highly recommend checking it out. It's a very entertaining podcast. Uh, so she gets a little, little from that because they have a Patreon and they have sp sponsors. She also does uh, freelance gigs producing. Uh, cause Tara has been a producer most of her life. Uh, she was a producer before she was talent. Although at this point she's been talent most of her life too, but, um, talent slash host. Uh, so she has some producing gigs that she does as well. Um, I believe Roger, uh, does this. I don't know if his wife has any gigs, um, honestly, but, um, but, but this, this is Roger's job. Uh, and this is my job. Uh, I, I mean, I say this is my job. This is my job is majority daily tech news show. That is where most of my money comes from. That's where most of the money for my company comes from. But there's also a little bit coming in from it's a thing. Uh, some coming in from know a little more, a word with Tom Merritt. Uh, I make a little bit money in a separate company co-owned by Veronica Belmont and I that does sword and laser. Uh, and I get paid by Brian Brushwood, whose company makes cord killers. Um, so that's where I get paid. It's not a lot. It's not enough. Uh, and, uh, so when my wife is working, we rely on that. Um, right now it's a little tight. I'm not going to lie. Uh, but yeah, uh, that is how we, that that's, that's how this goes. So yes, it, it is the majority income for all of all three of us. Um, so me, Sarah and Roger, um, and and there are there are some other things that we can do and do do uh, in order to to get by. Thank you, Corey. All right, um, I'm going to save James. I'm going to call you out, James. Great question uh, that you sent in last Friday, uh, and it's it, it deserves a good focus to to for me to answer it. So I'm going to save that one for next week. Don't let that keep you from sending me a question for next time. Uh, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Thank you all for supporting the show. Thank you for being a patron, and I will talk to you next time. Uh, Ryan, I didn't want to answer that in the recording, so I will answer it now. Um, I used to get a little bit from the book sales, you know, like maybe a couple thousand. Um, I get less than that now, but I also haven't really focused on promoting them. Uh, and I haven't put out a new one in a while. So, so that's, that's not a large, that's a very small part, uh, of my, uh, of my stuff. Um, yeah, but a good, but a, a totally fair question as well. All right. Now I am going to look back and see what else you said. Um, plucky duck chickies. All right. DTN. Oh, I like that Lord Molgar. I like that uh, emoji. 
Okie doke. So I need to post the editor's desk to the Patreon. I hope y'all don't mind if I do that while we chat here. Yeah, book sales right now is less than 1% of my income. DTNS shows, DTNS editor's desk. There it is. There's the recording. I will put the audio file. All right. It talks about percentage of DTNS income is of his a percentage. What percentage DTNS is of his income? Uh, what else did I talk about? The this is the thing you do these shows and it, it's a weird amnesia sets in. I don't remember anything I just talked about. Uh, I answered a question about a thing. This is a pretty good question. The pat clarification. Yes, thank you. That's a good one. Um, oh, uh, the Patreon merch. And how podcast chemistry comes together. Thank you. All right. Perfect. Kim is street. Okay. Next. This goes to the associate producers. Uh huh. I don't have any collections. Hmm. Editor's desk, editor's desk. Bye, cow. I mean, <laughs> that was unintentional. Bye, bio cow. <laughs> oh, I didn't see this. I didn't. I didn't include these. There were some funny uh, responses on the Patreon post itself. All right. There you go. Editor's desk is in the books. Yeah, so I wanted to talk about no a little more DNS with you. Well, Bash Brannigan, my first computer was a TI-99 4A as well. It's, uh, it's right there. Hey, Bill Meeks, what are you doing here? Just hanging out? I am going to present my screen. Here we go. Add it to the stage about DNS. And then I'm... I'm going to actually find the script. Come on. I'm going to put that over there too. So who out there has listened to this episode of About DNS? Um, interesting thing about this, and Justin and I plan to do a little behind the scenes. So if you're a patron of Know A Little More, you'll probably get more details than I'm going to give right now. Um, but, uh, this was, this is labeled a rewrite because I did a very technical episode about DNS. Oh, geez. Uh, a couple of years ago now. Yeah. 2021, August of 2021. So two years ago. Uh, and I was, I thought it was, uh, ripe for an update. So, I pulled because it was it was older. I, I was like, okay, we we needed a couple of episodes this this 
season that weren't related to Mother of All Demos directly. We we had six episodes that were going to be related to Mother of All Demos, and then we had room to fill in with other stuff. Uh, oh, thank you for subscribing. It's good to have you, The Unscrolled. Uh, welcome. So I rewrote DNS to try to fit it more into the current style now the dog and pony show is producing it because before it was very very straight read just me here's how dns works uh and i was like well let me let me get a, give a little more historical perspective to it right uh to pull out a little more personal story and as i did that i found out that uh the person who was responsible for keeping the dns list by hand for decades, Jake Feinler, uh, was an employee of Douglas Engelbart at the Augmentation Research Center where Engelbart had developed the mother of all demos. Now, it's not an overlap, right? It's not actually part of the mother of all demos. He didn't demonstrate the DN DNS or anything. But after everyone left, uh, he did the mother of all demos. It's a big deal. And then within a couple of years, everybody had gone. Uh, uh, people sort of like, well, I guess we did that, and they they took their knowledge and went elsewhere. At, while while he was re you know finding new things to investigate, uh, is when he brought in Jake Feinler because they had asked him. The folks doing the ARPANET had asked him to help write a manual on how it worked so that everyone could refer to it. And he got Jake Feinler, who was working in another part of the Stanford uh, uh, the the Stanford department that that ARC was in. Uh, he got her to come over and, and write that. She was at the, um, I guess she was at the Palo Alto Research, or no, she was she was at the Stanford Research Institute. And so he got her to come over to his department uh, and, and help research because she was in the literature research part of SRI. Uh, so there was a nice little, like it wasn't even planned. I was going to do DNS anyway, but there was a nice little connection there. And uh, like I said, Jake Feinler, Feinler manually updated the file that said, oh, if you're looking for this domain name, uh, it's this uh, address. It's this IP address. I want I hesitate to say IP address because I'm not sure it was always IP address in the earliest days, but it was a network number of some of some part and and sort of a, a map of, of how to get to it. So, uh, yeah. Uh, oh, thank you, Trevor THMP, for your subscription. Appreciate that. Anyway, uh, I found that fascinating, uh, and so I really enjoyed telling that story of who Jake Feinler is. Uh, she is still alive, uh, ninety-two years old. Uh, how she came to become the person who did that, and uh, and and how her work sort of kept the f the home fires burning until it, it became a more uh, automated system that we know today. And there's a little bit in here about, you know, how it actually works and, and DNS sec and security and all that sort of thing. But, uh, but yeah, I, I really enjoyed, I really enjoyed the serendipity of this, uh, of sitting down to be like, well, let me, let me see if I can pull a more uh, human story out of this to, to kind of add it and give you a little additional information, even if you heard the episode two years ago. Uh, and, and I found way more, uh, than, than I could have hoped for there. Uh, so yeah, we are, we are midway through season 10 of know a little more. Um, the, Mother of All Demos was, of course, the first episode. Hypertext, mouse, and word processing were all uh, referring back to the Mother of All Demos because those three things were all demonstrated. But we talk a lot about how they came about before Engelbart got a hold of them, or in Mouse case, he kind of invented it. There were precursors, but he made the modern mouse what I would, what you would recognize as a mouse. Uh, arguably, he was the first to do that. Um, and then we did the DNS, which is going to have a connection. Next week is a total departure, Risk Five, uh, the the chips. Although there's an interesting backstory there, it's not related to the mother of all demos directly. It does have a, a couple of characters crossover, but not an Engelbart connection. Then we're going to get back to the mother of all demos uh, for October 19th, October 26th. Uh, we'll do video conferencing and collaborative editing. Um, and then we got two more episodes that are a departure at the end. 
Uh, tentatively, I might do demo, as in the idea of a demonstration. Like, what? How did demos come about? That eh, might be a little big to take on, though. Uh, so I'm, I'm also thinking about doing large language models or transform transformative models, something like that. A little basic introduction of like this is how they actually work. That's also a big one, but it's something I could fit into 15, 20 minutes uh, if you boil it down. And then for the last episode, I'm kind of planning on doing Aloha Net. Uh, which is the precursor to Ethernet. And it's a nice setup. It does not cross over with Engelbart, but it does cross over with Xerox Park, which is where all the people from Engelbart's uh, lab, not all the people, but a lot of the people that worked on the inventions that he showed in the Mother of All Demos ended up at Xerox Park. Uh, so yeah, so I think we might we might end up doing that. Ah, uh, yeah. Way back, I used to help with manually updating the router tables. So Sierra Pola, oh, that's so cool. Uh, that's amazing. Uh, okay, yeah, Ryan, go ahead. It's always better to send an email uh, so I can I can pass it along to, to Justin and Amos. But if you don't mind doing both, I'm curious to hear it now. Uh, and then I can, and then if you could also send it by email or, or I might remember, or I might remember <laughs> to pass it along. Uh, anyway, I think that's, that's kind of everything I have there. So if you just want to chat, I'll stick around for a little bit longer. Um, I am not on daily tech news show today cause I'm working on all this stuff that I'm talking about doing editor's desk and all of that. Uh, but I'm, I'm happy to st still stick around and, and chat a little bit. I've got a few other things I got to do, like go to the grocery store, prep cord killers. Did did Veronica post sword and laser yet? Nope. So when once she does that, then I got to promote that. I have to do my Korean homework. It's my last Korean class uh, this Friday. There was a mention to the audio clip that was edited out. It was the only time the narrative seemed out of place. Otherwise, I'm really enjoying the narrative edit. Yeah, that's going to happen. Um, so there's the clean the people on Patreon wanted the clean edition. So they get the clean edition, which means you're going to sometimes have me referring to a clip that won't be in there. Um, Cause we're, we're producing the show for the edited version uh, and the narrative version that just goes into the, the Patreon is, is sort of behind the scenes bonus kind of, kind of stuff. Yeah, CR Pole. I imagine it was a major pain. I mean, when I said it, it was cool, it's cool that you were there at that time. I imagine it was definitely not cool to have to do. Uh, I totally get that. Um, Xerox Park employees were forced to sign NDA. I mean, I think a lot of research places uh, require folks to sign NDAs even still. I think that's that's not that uncommon. I'm not, I'm not surprised to hear that. Uh, hey, Jackknife, what's up? I mean, if you're going to work on, on secretive research, then you're going to, you're going to sign an NDA. Raymond over on YouTube asks, having been to Korea, what did you notice the difference between the tech scene there versus in the U S I, I did talk about this a little bit previously because there was a similar question, but honestly, I didn't notice much that was that different. Um, I'm trying to think back now. I was surprised how many iPhones there were. I thought it would be much more Samsung dominant uh, or or at least Android dominant. And uh, just, uh, you know, off the cuff, back of the envelope, what I saw walking around, uh, I'd say it's about 50% uh, Samsung, 50% Apple. And, okay, 48% Samsung, 48% Apple, because there were other, other phones out there, but... Um, yeah, thanks, Ryan. Thanks for hanging out. Take care. So that was the big thing. Uh, internet, much more ubiquitous. Um, although it's getting pretty ubiquitous here too, but you know, Wi-Fi everywhere, but you don't even need Wi-Fi everywhere because the 5G signal is so good. Spe speed is never even a question. You're never, you're never thinking like, Oh, am I going to get good enough speed at this hotel or at this cafe? Like it's just, always great everywhere, which, which is interesting because Korean air doesn't have internet on its transatlantic or trans-Pacific flights, which 
you may say uh, like, well, yeah, Trans-Pacific flights, they don't have internet. No, Delta has really fast internet on its Trans-Pacific flights. A lot of other uh, airlines have, have implemented an internet. So granted, I don't expect every airline to have implemented it. It's still early in that in that technology, but you would think with the internet being as good as it is in Korea, that Korean Air would have been leading that charge rather than than lagging behind. Those are the two things that jump off the top of my, my head. A um, lot of lot of things work over Kakao Talk and text message. Um, so, like you, you know, signing up. There's a lot of of restaurants where you sign up and they will send you. Uh, a text message to let you know when your table's ready and they really encourage you to scan your cacao talk ID in there so they can give you even more information. I think because they want to get your information and be able to market stuff to you too. But it worked without doing that. Um, and the app ecosystem is entirely different. Uh, Google Maps is okay, but you want Naver Maps. Uh, and Naver is the dominant search engine. It also is a music app and provides a lot of other things. Uh, Melon is the dominant music. App. It's the Spotify there. Uh, Kakao Talk, Kakao Taxi. Uh, you know, the, it's a lot. A lot of the things that are in the rest of the world, like Uber and Google, exist. They're just not as popular as as these domestic operations. Oh, uh, good question. Uh, when you wrote and published your book, did you take the traditional route or self-publish? Um, sort of both. I have mostly self-published my books. So I've written, I've, I've published a good dozen uh, books. I think, yeah, I've got a bunch of them up here. So these are all self-published. These are all self-published books, and these are just some of them. Um, Len Peralta and I did that one together. This is the first one I did. Um, but Pilot X. Pilot X and Trigger I did with a company called Inkshares. Uh, so they are crowdfunded, so you get people to pre-order enough books to make it worth it for them to publish it. Uh, and then they publish it like a traditional publisher. So even though getting your book published is different, uh, the, the process after, you know, of editor editing and promotions and everything is, is more like a traditional publisher. And those books show up in Barnes and Nobles and Borders and WH Smith's and book chains like that. Killbot404, good to see you. Uh, I watched a documentary about researchers and science working on stuff so secret they had to completely move to work on it. Yeah, Manhattan Project. Oh, yeah, it's called Oppenheimer. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, research NDA is is fairly, fairly common. All right. Bill Meeks has a copy of 10 State. That's cool. Any opinion on the new patron? Are you still grandfathered in? Uh, yeah. Uh, most of the new patron we already had uh, because we volunteered to beta test. So the, the digital selling and the um, uh, the free trials and stuff, we, we had already done that. We'd helped them test that. Uh, so it doesn't feel that new to me. I haven't actually looked to see if my, my uh, the logo... Where's the Patreon Patreon app on my phone? Yeah, the logo. I mean, what I'm glad is that the logo, the new app logo, doesn't look that much different color-wise than the old one. So I still know that that's Patreon, but the bean thing is a little, little interesting. Oh, yeah. I had forgotten all about that. Bill Meeks. Oh, there's no forward on this one. I think that was a, is it an afterward then? But you're right. There's a gallery. Yes, yes, it's in the app. It's an afterward. There you go. Creating the 10. Bill Meeks. How did I forget that? The bleedingcool.com interview. That's awesome. Thanks for reminding me of that. Morning-ish song, sang. I always do that. 
who which one of you are the one that always wants me to do a uh a shelf tour because i think I'll, I'll finish on that today shelf tour anyone anyone going once going twice because i've done this one and i did what was the other one i did did i do that one Oh, I did this one. I did that one and this one. It was a quick one. So those two are covered in previous episodes. Um, which shelf? Which shelf should I do? What do you want next? There's even two shelves that you can't see. The hidden shelves. But I can't really tour those because you can't see them. <laughs> Unless I just pulled everything up. One's really not that interesting. They're just full of books. Um, if you don't have a request, I'll pick one of my own. Oh yeah, there's two. There's shelves above too that you you can't see. Did those used to be in the shot? I feel like these up here used to be in the shot. Maybe they don't. Maybe they aren't. Maybe one day I'll I'll pull wide. I'll uh, I'll pull back the camera wide so you can see more. Or I could or I could switch cameras and, and do the do the Mac so you can see them that way. No preference, no preference on the uh, on the shelf tour. Then I'll go here. This one, hidden shelves tour is going to be uh, take some planning. I'll get back to that one. Uh, okay, so I have a reprint of the Green Book which was referenced in a uh, sword and laser uh, book that we read. I don't know why this is here. The last ever small size TV guide from October 9th through the 16th, 2005 with the cast of scrubs on the front replicating a 1976 mash cover. I suppose Scrubs was considered the heir to MASH. Let's see. What was on Thursday night primetime broadcast television? Uh, the Apprentice, Will and Grace, CSI Crime Investigation, Night Stalker, Without a Trace, Survivor Guatemala. Sex in the City was on broadcast TV. Huh. Friends. Oh, that was that's an independent channel. That's why. Friends and Seinfeld. Should have known back in 2005 when they were popular in uh, syndication. Uh, this is a copy of The Lives of a Cell by Lewis Thomas, which was given to me by my Aunt Esther in 1975. And she said it was one of her favorite books to read. And it made her think, and she thought I would enjoy it. You know, I always remember her writing a foreword telling me that, but it just says her name. Maybe she wrote it in a card or something. Uh, okay, so then Stephen Hawking's Grand Design, uh, Apollo 11, the NASA, NASA Mission Reports, Cosmos by Carlos Sagan. Uh, oh, uh, Star Wars, the rise of Skywalker exclusive poster giveaway. Oh no, this is just a flyer for the giveaway at El Capitan. Uh, ultimate come back here. Ultimate guide to the cosmos by David Dickinson. <laughs> I actually forgot this was here. Uh, a surface RT it hasn't been plugged in. So the battery's dead, but. Uh, Chris Mancini, Chris Mancini's Long Ago and Far Away, Volume One. Uh, the Adventures of Mary Shelley by Bria Grant. And what are these? These are calendars. What is this? Oh, this is the fakest stuff. Bill, speaking of Bill Meeks, yes, this is the the fakest uh, notebook. 
and and a note uh, from Bill. Boy, Bill's all over my stuff today. Uh, these are previous This Week in Science calendars. Rich DeMuro's book, 101 Handy Tips for the iPhone. Probably all uh, out of date now. Ah, yes. Uh, Big Jim's To Love Me or Not, Global Logistics Haikus. One of my favorite haiku books. Los Angeles is Hideous, Poems About an Ugly City by Andrew Heaton. Another, uh, oh, this is an iPad. No, 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 it's not. This is a, a Chrome tablet with a uh, magnetic case. Uh, Girly, Girly Drinks by Mallory O'Mara. Uh, Inappropriately Human by Andrew Heaton. Uh, Greg Van Eekhout's uh, Voyage of the Dogs. Beyond the Story, the 10-year record of BTS. The complete La Seraphim Japanese uh, releases. Picture of Sawyer the Dog. Picture of me and Eileen at Christmas. And picture of Ray the Dog, all taken with Eileen's little uh, Instamax instant camera. Uh, we have Her Art She Loves uh, Dog, which I bought more than 10 years ago and has always been on the uh, shelf behind me. The box below it is what the box it came in. This is from the Alchemy of Souls immersive exhibit that we went to in Korea. If you saw on my Instagram, I had some pictures of us in this place with mirrors and photos of ourselves behind us. Uh, this, this unlocked things as you walked through. I thought we'd have to give it back and they let us keep it. My Commodore 64, uh, a, a photo picture of me and uh, Suga of BTS. Uh, it, it really isn't him. It was like one of those photo booth things. Uh, these sunglasses were branded somehow, and I don't remember. I think they were, came with an anime promotion or something. It doesn't say on them anymore. Sunglasses. Uh, very old copy of Lady of the Lake given to me by my friend Cindy. Information Doesn't Want to Be Free by Cory Doctorow. How to Fix Copyright by James Patrie. And ah, the Out of Bounds Comedy Festival in Austin that I was a part of uh, with the Night Attack guys, Brian Brushwood and Justin Robert Young. And Romney Malco was part of that too. I think that's everything there. Oh, hidden. Yeah. Oh, there's Chewan. Chewan and Kazaha from La Seraphim are hiding behind there. This is uh, what they gave us when they laid us all off from Tech TV. Tech TV, May 2004. It was the, that's the, the day Tech TV went off the air. They gave us a cube. Oh, yeah. And a uh, little Scott Johnson art back here kind of fell down. It's an Alea Iacta Est uh, poster. So there you go. That's that shelf. A lot of books. And discoveries, things that I forgot were up there. I need to clean this shelf, to be honest. All right, folks, uh, that, that does it for me. I'm going to get back to work. But this has been fun. Thanks for hanging out. Oh, my gosh. I left your uh, question up there the entire time. Sorry about that. Uh, until tomorrow. Glad you enjoyed that. Talk to you soon. Goodbye.